you if you want. Yeah, all right. Let's so get started. It's on the air. I guess I'll move over here with you. Thanks everybody for coming. Um, hope everybody's been able to be fishing a lot. We're in the hot part of the season now, so everybody hopefully has been able to get out and have some fun. We'll do we'll, we'll leave some time for for uh, fishing sports again. Uh, today, Tristan's going to be talking to us about night fishing. Dave's going to share a little bit also. Um, but we appreciate Tristan. He kind of pinched it for us. We didn't really plan for this month. We've all been so busy. Um, but I'll, I'll turn it over to Tristan and let him start talking. He's been having some really good success with night fishing. And I think right now, with all the wake boats, where they are and stuff, we want to go back in. Uh, fishing at night's one of those more productive ways to fish. So, there are features in the field one of myself. Uh, not much to pick from over there. Oh, make sure that you've got a raffle ticket. We've got lots of door prizes, so everybody should get one. Yeah. All right, we're going to talk about night fishing over there. Uh, start fishing any body of water that has walleye. Uh, not generally just speaking for one lake. So, let's start. This was at starvation last this yeah. just last weekend. This had to be uh the X and RX the Yeah, I hadn't moved that one but I have it over there. Perfect. So what time of night can start? Uh I start like four thirty in the afternoon. I like to get the evening back. Uh can you yeah, can I get Jack and then get down the beans of booze and jack just beans of booze. Thank you. So this was starvation. Um, we were green lighting and we were throwing swim baits, cream baits, and just giving multiple presentations to the fish. Um, I was using the live scope to target fish and to use the green light. So uh, what I found out about green lighting is the big fish don't like the green light up close. So all these big fish came out. As you see the circle around the boat, all those came out past the green light, but they're hunting around the so if you're fishing below, you're catching small, small walleye or uh, smallies, uh, perch, um, but you're fishing on the out perimeter of the green light, that's when you would get the bigger fish. Are they suspended or are they on the bottom? Uh, no, they don't come suspended. Yeah. Or they would come in on my scope, they would come to the bottom, and then they would shoot up after the prey. So you jigging them or? Multiple <coughs> okay. reasons. So slip bobbering. I'll put some slip bobber on with a, a net crawler, or uh, you can put it on a jig. So I'm going to use the slip bobber. Tell them how you use the slip bobber. Uh, so you put your slip bobber, and then you'll put a, your tungsten weight, put a tungsten weight and a bead to the bead so that it doesn't make up your bond. Okay. If you're not, and then you put your leader around four foot leaders, enough to where I can still hook it up to my rod and reel it up. I don't make it longer to it. Where you loop it so not all that excess line when you're trying to you know tie it up to move a different spot. So starvation is I loop it uh, use logs of leader because it's clear. So any other reservoir I can get away with two or three foot leaders for slip over. Um but throwing mm-hmm. perch this is not the one I was throwing, they didn't have it here, but it's more uh, the perch pattern. That's what I was throwing, that's what uh, some of these fish came on. And then trolling at night. The blue light work just as good as green, or is green the, the color you use? I've never blue used light. blue. Okay. Yeah, this is the only one I've ever used. Um, Here's, here's a 
smallies, those were non-stop, so that was bringing it in. They were eating all the plankton that would come around the light. They would come all over to the surface of the water. And uh, after I caught that fish, I put the live well to take pictures. Bit spit up <coughs> and uh, smallies in the light well. So that's what they're coming in, eating those smallies from the green one. And that's what they, uh, they put that big swim bait on. This is Deer Creek. I showed this picture last time. I did a presentation, but this is a full moon uh, two months ago. Uh, that was in Deer Creek, and that was trolling. Uh, oh, that's so nice. I don't know. We bought this. It's not this exact one, but what one did you use? Um, I can't remember off the top of my head, but it I can, I can show you after. Was it kind of like that birch colored thing? Or? Um, yeah, yeah, it was birch. It was a, it was a dark green. Um, green line. Um, green line, I would say was the key of catching big fish, but just covering water, we would sit for 40 minutes, 30 minutes, and then just fish points. So fish weed edges, and then we would fish in front of points. And I wouldn't stay more than 30 minutes. <coughs> I know that green line you have to wait for everything to come, but I feel like if you're in the area, they'll come here, or they won't. But on live scope, I would see them, I would sit there, and I would see, you know, the bait fish and little fish come in, and then you can see the bigger fish come in. Crawlers. Everyone else is jigging a night crawler. Um, but I would notice if you just did a jig and a night crawler, half jig and a night crawler, they would they would nip you. But if you put a stinger hook on it, you were more likely to get it because you know, they would just nip you on the on the crawl end of the crawler. But casting swim baits was our was our key to catching bigger bigger fish um, and trolling fast on green baits at night. So How fast? Uh, two miles an hour with with planer boards. Uh, not a lot of people are coming on playing boards. It's it's nice because you can get away from the boat, and then you can also you know spread out your area and cover a lot of water. How do you where you going with the playing boards? <coughs> Stag room. So I'll put three on depending on how many people we have in the boat. You can put you know shoreline. So at night I would burn down shoreline and uh, put three <coughs> on boards, one at 15 feet. So I'm hogging that one's you know hugging the shoreline, and then I would spread them out from. How do you get it down? Mostly just with the rapalas or? Yep. Yeah. yeah. So if I'm trying to go deep, I'll use, you know, like a deep diving crate bait. Um, or I'll snap weight them. So it just depends. Sometimes you snap weight them and the fish, you know, they, they see that snap weight, that snap weight coming through them first. So then I'll use light core or uh, a deep diving crate bait. How far back do you go from the snap weight to put your lure on? Just depends on the <coughs> deep <coughs> position. So say 30 feet. I'll go to about 25 to 30 feet out and then put my snap weight on. You don't want how to far back is the leader from the snap weight? 40 feet. So 40 feet, I'll let 40 feet. And then, then you put it on. And then and you go, how much further do you go out when you put the weight on? Just depends where you want it. Just so if you're down. trying to go to the bottom, then you're going to go down to the bottom. you got 40 feet out. So you can <laughs> dive curve. There's a chart uh, that you can, uh, uh, that gives you uh, <laughs> Exact. Where you go out with your weights and speed and, and uh, what size of snap weight you're using. Okay, thanks. Yeah. Any questions? Uh, do you find that uh, walleye fishing is better on full moons? I fished nine days, so I fished four days up to the full moon. The full moon, I didn't have any better success on full moon, but our last full moon, we didn't have the moon. It was too cloudy, we had overcast. So, but previous previous times, it's a hit or miss. I've had where full moon's better, but I think if you just hit, you know, if you know where the bite's going on and you hit it just right, then then you'll do good. But yeah, we didn't have any full moon on on uh, starting for Deer Creek last week 
or a week and a half ago, and we didn't do as good as the previous month with full moon, but we still got fish. Any other questions? How do you pin down your area that you're going to go to? Like when you're scouting on the lake, where do you start? What's your starting points? It depends on time of year. So you're either fishing weeds. I look at it like two fishing weeds, fishing deep, or fishing structure. So I, I don't fish unless I scan. I scan the area side image, live scope. I don't just go to an area and just start fishing. I'll scan it first, check and see if there's any bait or fish, and then I'll fish it. But how long do you scan before you decide, yeah, this is the spot? The whole area I plan on to fish. Do you, do you take a whole day before that, or do you just do that like an hour before you start, or, or how long? No, I'll, I'll uh, pull up to a point. If, I, if it's something that I have to scan from afar, because I don't want to blow it out. So most points, you can't just go up and scan it, because you can't go back and fish it. Some of our fish are they're finicky, clear of the water, they can see you. So at starvation, I noticed that is, the fish far away on my life scope, I can look at about 65, 70 and see them. Any further, you're questioning it. But the closer I got to them, they didn't want to be vertical. So they wouldn't, the bigger fish wouldn't hit a jig or a crawl, crawler or anything vertical unless it was more aggressive. Um, but they, when they were far out, so 65, 70 feet in front of you, I would see them with my life scope. And then I would cast my swim bait past and bring it over top. So, anyway. <coughs> so do you, are you using light kind of rails or what are you getting? Uh, for trolling? Yeah. So trolling, I like to, you know, know exactly where I'm at. So I want to be dialed, you know, where the fish are. Look at my graph if they're suspended. Then you know how far you're going out because their baits tell you. On the, on the back of this, on this one right here, four to eight feet. And so on your line counter, you know, you can, you know exactly how far you're going out if you're just no line counter. You're, you're just guessing how far you're out. So, and then planer boards, it's, you know, it's crucial to know how far you're out before you put your planer board on. Because if you're going over structure or weeds, you're just constantly going through the weeds if you don't know where you're at in the water column. How far back do you put your repose? Stagger them. So I'll start depending on where the fish are. Mm -hmm. I'll let my graph tell me if they're suspended, then I just set them at that depth. If I'm just trying to cover water, 25, 45, 65, and just stagger them out, let the fish tell you where they're at, and then set your boards that way, or your, your lines. Mm -hmm. So there's a couple apps that'll help you with that, because I, I wasn't very good with that, and I didn't realize how off I was from what I thought it was, where my bait was. So there's an app called Precision Trolling. If you're gonna do that, you might as well just pay for the lifetime because it's not worth it to buy like individual ones. And it's, it's like a hundred bucks. Hundred ones. ones. But I like once I knew exactly how long to put it back and how like and if I use this clip weight, how much to put out. That's when I started catching crank weights. Before that, I was only do, ever doing bottom backers, but it, that helped me start catching on crank weights. Okay. And there was another one, Philip, that you sent me too. And it might not be as expensive on um, Yeah, it's called Trollmaster. 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 Mm -hmm. But there's some really good apps that'll just like, and, and you can like select a specific bait. They even have new ones, so like the Honey Badger or the Money Badger. Yeah. They just came out this year, so you get all the updates whenever they come if you get the lifetime one. Gotcha. And that way you just pick your bait, you pick how deep you want, and it tells you how much line to let out. Yeah. And, they're, and it's usually pretty heavy, like within the foot. Yeah, the, and it depends on the line diameter too. So you'll put your the line diameter, what line you're using, and they have it all dope charted out for you. So I would recommend if you're doing a lot of trolling. It'll save you a lot of money. You'll, you'll lose a lot of baits if you if you don't know where you're at. And if you don't know where you're at, you're just you're just suspended fishing and hoping a fish sees it. You know? So let your charts use your use your graphs. Let the, let the graphs tell you where the fish are. That's what they're built for. Just don't go out and, and wander, just start fishing. I would use your, you know, side imaging. Side imaging will help you limit a lot of water. And then live scope, that just keys you in and, and tells you what the fish are, they're, what they want. <coughs> the, the language helps you dial it in. 
When you're side scanning, are you looking for structure or fish? Both. Yeah. So no, generally here in Utah, like I fish the lakes but not to where I know the structure. I usually can tell what it is by looking at the shore. Um, I'm using it to see where they're at on the structure. And then you use your, your down division to see if they're suspended or not. Side division kind of tells you that, but after a certain point, you can't see them. So there might be fish there that are just suspended. And that's important to know too. Um, covering weeds. Um, the big issue going on right now, starvation, salaratus, salaratus, the whole bay was just covered in water, or uh, water, uh, weeds. Uh, they're all torn up because the weeds are at the surface and the surf coats are going up there and just cutting the weeds up. So it's all bloated out uh, across the whole bay of salaratus. So you couldn't control it efficiently because you would just fell over baits. But uh, fishing the weed lines up in salaratus, I found it was really beneficial to keep just hugging the weed line. So side imaging, I would come in, mark it all, weed point it, and then pull my boards right next to it, or cast the weed line. Or jig it, the weed line is like 18 feet to, to shore. And they're up in, up in those weeds, uh, green lighting the weeds, you would get numbers. Um, yeah. <coughs> Which green light set up look like? Tristan, I've got two aluminum lights yeah. here. Okay. Yeah, I have a picture of mine. I didn't bring it. Uh, they're different brands. They're different yeah. brands. If you want, we can show you what these are right now. Yeah. You'll just look at them. What's that? Man, your thing with the bag, it's like golf clubs. Yeah. People were nervous when I walked in with this. <laughs> and I actually brought a battery. Um, Little six inches. <laughs> yeah, mine's like this big, but it has hundreds of LEDs. Yeah, when I set my green light, everyone asks how deep you set them. I, I feel like six feet, just enough to where it's not blinding me. Because if they're too shallow, then it, then it annoys your eyes because it's too bright. Uh, I set it about six feet and, and then leave it there. I know, I know send a 20 foot ring around my boat. <coughs> How deep is the water in the when you're setting set up the green line? Oh, you see, but you move with the green line. Yeah, so I, I work points or weed ends. I don't sit very long. I don't, I don't want to wait for a fish to come. I want to come for a fish to fish in that area and then keep moving. Um, I fish uh, outside of the points and then I move in. So uh, I fish from 25 feet of water to 13 to 12 feet of water. So instead of waiting for it to come to you, just kind of slowly moves on? Uh, I did that, yeah. I would move across points and then just work the sections and cast. So I, I noticed that the fish, when I would come over, like, over the points with the green line, uh, they would see it. I'd find that. <laughs> I'm not going to miss the phone. <laughs> uh, apparently, this was working an hour or two ago, but I think my battery, my lithium battery, finally died. Because I'm not able to. Yeah, I would, uh, I would work the points. You have a cigarette lighter plug on that? What? You have a cigarette lighter plug for it? Then oh, here. Over here. Yeah, if you want to. So I'll plug this and wall and plug that in the other. There you go. Okay. So yeah, I would work the points. So I would just, I would slowly with my trolling motor, just just move slow and keep casting. And then I always have a dead stick down, a bonus fish. But on my screen, I wouldn't see any big fish come in. But yeah, just for this one, they they the lights are too bright, or they know that they would just shoot in. Every fish will come in off the bottom and then shoot up and grab. I would just buzz my bait at fish that I see, and then they would spread me. Um, but yeah, I wouldn't sit very long. As long as I sat, it would be about 40 minutes. What head are you using on your screen? Uh, the VMC or some ones that have custom board. Quarters. 
course. Uh, quarter, it just depends on the swim bait size I was fishing, or the swim bait size. Uh, that the big fish that I caught uh, came on a seven inch snook. So it's battle tail, and basically I was just making a lot of noise. It had an under, under spin on it, so there's more Colorado under spin, there's lots more noise. So it's we're covering water with big swim baits, and um, you're just working over top of weeds or, or rock points. Uh, so. That's why I'm broke. Oh, yeah, the question. Oh, yeah, the works. So, uh, yeah, the question earlier talked, uh, had me talk about playing boards. Uh, I've used a few different companies, but um, Northland Tackle, their playing boards are. Uh, Northland. Church. Uh, no, I can't think of the brand of the board, but I've noticed that. Any, anyone know how plant boards work? The point of plant boards? Yeah, so get some out of your prop wash off this side of the boat. You know, I know that the uh, wall, I get a little prop shy and stuff like that. So it just gets you out there away from uh, away from the boat. Yeah, yeah. So you get to the away from the board from the boat, and then you can stack your lines. You can fish more more lines, and you can turn too. So never want to know what's going. You know, turning produces fish, or sometimes it doesn't. You know, they just want to go straight. But you can stack your lines out, and then you can control banks. I like to control banks, and then I can kill the board. So when I'm fishing like Dare Creek, I'll send up the short, the shoreline. But you also get to speed up on the on the shoulder, and then you can slow down and kill it, and then you can speed back up. Usually, when you kill that board, you'll turn, and then you'll kill it, and that inside board will stall, and that's usually. Fish bite. Yeah. Those bigger fish. How far apart are you put? Um, ten feet. I try to. I try how to. How far? You must have a difference how far out the side you put it. So how far out? Yes, so they're not the same, right? It, no, no, no. So I'll set. I'll set three boards on on a shoreline. So I'll, I'll run one right on the shore. Like that one is just right on the shore. Right on the shore. That's the one that's snagging on. Yeah. It's, I want it right on the shore, and then I'll just Is that the first one you put out on that side, or the last one? First one. Yep. Okay. Yep, the first one, and then you put your second one, or depending on how you're going to fish, and I just stagger them, because most of the fish are hugging that shoreline. There is suspended fish out there, because Deer Creek, you're fishing 30 feet. The walls are straight up here, drop-offs, and those fish are hugging the shoreline. There is some out there suspended, you'll get those too. But I'm mostly trying to hug the shorelines. And I'm just buzzing the shorelines back and forth where I, where I mark my fish, and then I just work them and switch over, and then I'll also come back and try to get those fish if they didn't go. How late do you fish at there at night? I fish all night. Do you? Yeah. So you start at 4.30 you go through the night? Yeah. yeah, usually I get off the water by, by 7. If I fish on Friday night, I usually try to get off the water before all the wake skiers come in the morning. Mm. So. Tristan, this is a bull one, but uh, about 9,000. So I know the small ones will put out probably about the same time. This light, this light will put out uh, around the boat about a 20 foot circle yep. of green light around the boat. Yeah, my little one put, my boat's 21 foot, and it'll put a circle around it, and it's about 15 feet off the side. So you just have it hanging just like that, just out of, on the other side of the boat? Yeah, I wait mine, so it would just, otherwise it tries to float it up. Put it in the or this one? This, this one is basically yeah, yeah. down here. So that's when that's when the big pot. I think. And did you bring one of the ones that you made, Danny? Yeah, Danny, 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 has Danny, one. Danny, Danny made his. This is the ones that I made. He made them. Yeah, he can make one for about forty bucks. Yeah. What did it cost you otherwise? Under thirty, twenty, thirty, fifty. <laughs> Why <you> start selling? <laughs> I don't like making them that way. Well. <laughs> I can tell you a little bit about what to get if you want to make one. Yeah, these you don't have any questions. Wait. So that's why you run that triple stack. So we're going uh, the rod holders on the side of your boat. It's you know, so that's just strictly so you, you're, 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 when you're trolling, you're playing a board every time. You don't troll any other way pretty much. No, no, no. You know, I'll troll my cordy So I like my like board and the fish are yeah, suspended off the back. Yeah, the board is fishing a little bit deeper. So, so you don't have to use snap weights. So let's say you've got six guys on your boat or three guys and you're putting out two rods per guy and, uh, and you got that triple. When 
you put the first outside rod out that's going to the bank, does that go on the bottom or the top when you on your staff that you got for your rod holders? You work that on the bottom. You're talking about trees? Yeah, your trees. Yeah, so if I'm if I'm throwing a lot of boards, yeah. So the furthest board out would be the top. At the top? Yep. And yeah. then <coughs> you, I can I can angle my trees. So he's talking about trees. So I have um, rod holders that have one here, one here, and here. So you just staggers like that. So that way you can stagger the lines if you're running boards. Yeah, because it could be tough running planar boards two on each side if your yeah. rod holders are. Yeah, and yeah. the other reason is to keep the lines up, the rods up, because when you get water chop or big waves, it hits the line. And so then you get board skip. And every time that jumps, you gotta think your bait is moving about three feet and it doesn't look natural. So then it could make your bait do totally what it's supposed sure. to or not supposed to do. So that helps it keep your line up sure. and then it just lets it skip over top of the waves. Okay. So staggering and then keeps the surge. It's called board surge. Okay. And, and there's just shoreline bait, you're trying to run like in two foot of water? Um no, so so say I'm working train track side on at, at Deer Creek. That's it's one foot of water to thirty foot. You have your points. It's ten. You know, say you have your normal points that come out. But I'm I'm not going to set my board more than my in, inside board more than ten foot because I'm working up. I want that to run directly down parallel with the shore, and I don't want to have to go out to cover shallower water. So I'll set my different depths so that way I can just run straight down and I can stand. <coughs> but you want to be you know down but not on bottom. Because then you're constantly picking up uh, weeds or snagging. You lose a lot of bait really quick. Especially when you have two or three boards out yeah. and you side to come around and turn around. Sometimes it's just easier just to snap it and just keep going. Especially when you're guiding you know, trying to turn around and come back just to get more bait. That's a cool board. I can see planer board being uh, kind of dangerous if the lake's busy too because of the span. If you're going 30, 40 feet out and a jet skier goes by, I bet you guys have those circumstances yeah. too, huh? So at Deer Creek, the biggest issue is the kite boarders. They don't realize that you have boards out. You know, they're used to coming and jumping over ski boats. Sure. Like people people like you jump the kite boarders, they sure. jump over, but they'll come and grab your line. They don't they don't see your board. And they'll grab your line and take off, you know. They they don't know what's going on. And it's filling your line up. <laughs> <laughs> Do you put lights on your boards at night or yeah, low glow sticks. Oh, so that glow sticks. Oh, glow so sticks. on the on the tattle tail, I'll put a glow stick or most guys put reflective 3M stickers. Mm -hmm. So when you shine your light, you can see the flag. So a lot of them have the stickers now. Yeah. But you, you have them set, they'll say left and they'll say right side if you have planar boards. Yeah, there's a left and right, and they, right. they got three of these clips. Yeah. One thing I did line. on my old ones is I had, I bought these little like, they're submergible lights that you buy for weddings or whatever, and you put them in the water, and you can Velcro them right on, Right on top of the plate board, they weigh next to nothing, and then if you have a reflector, you don't have to <coughs> shine your light, you can see everything the whole time. Yep. It's kind of nice. So I have a light on the side of the boat that I can just maneuver and oh, shine my boards. Nice. So that way, if it gets dark, if you go on the side where the moon's not shining, you can't see. And I don't like wearing a headlight all night because it gives you a headache. Sure. So then I'll just turn my, my light and shine the bed boards. Unless I'm working close to a bank. If I'm working close to a bank, I don't want the reflection off the hill back to the water. Uh, I'm a strong believer that shining water or light into water up shallow is going to scare some fish. So I kind of just point it to where I can see my my boards going across the surface, but I'm not shining it to where there's all the beams going straight in the water. If you do so, some braided lines on them too, they kind of slip through. They're hard to kind of do that. They have on there. That's a special yeah. clips for them. Yeah. For braid to go around. Otherwise, it just slides. Yeah. Yeah. That's why I just. I so yeah, yeah, yeah. What speed do you like to go average? It depends on the water temp. The colder the water, the slower I go. The warmer the water, after 70 degrees, don't be shy to go two, two and a half, three miles an hour. It just wow. depends on what bait you're using. Some baits don't go fast. They say you troll this one at two and a half miles an hour, it's going to blow out. What I mean by blow out, say you're 20 feet down, you get to the, the speed that this is meant for. By past that speed, it's going to blow out and it's going to shoot up. 
And so it's just, you're, you're not even going to realize it unless you're watching your tip. So you're saying we over water faster? Yes. Okay. So then when it's colder, how, how slow do you get? 0.8, 1 mile an hour. And you're just walking that bait. Colder, colder the water, you want that bait just to, to walk. And then the faster you go with, say, like this, this bait, it's going to it's shad and it's got a ton of ton action. of action. So the faster you go, it just looks, they just like it. The predators. So how do you adjust by the temperature? Do you have kind of a set gauge in your head? Or, like if the water temp's 60, what, how fast do you go? Yeah, so yeah, so say from ice off till about 55 degrees, I'll stay from, I'll start slower. And then I, I can speed up. So I start doing my, turn, my S turns to see if you turn left, that outside board speeds up or, or what, whatever you're doing, that speeds up, then you know you dive a little bit faster. That's the other thing I love about the plant boards is you get more variance when yes. you're turning mm -hmm. on those outside edges. So yeah. that's why I like the drum yeah. banks, because you can shoot over, shoot over a point and then you can kill the motor. I use my front controlling motor too. So I got my kicker on and I just use that for proportion. And then I use my kick or my bow mount for steering. So I get about <coughs> a mile and a half out of my kicker and then I bump it up to about five on my old tracks and then I use that for steering. So that, that way I, my hand's free, I can use my remote. Sounds like you're pretty busy though. It's busy. Yeah, yeah. yeah trolling like is I not. I wonder how you stay awake. Now I don't. No, I don't. You don't stand, you don't hunt, everything. You're constantly, if you're not catching, just change your baits, check your baits. Just don't keep trolling because there's so many times where I fish a whole wall and it's just being out laziness. I'm like, that bait's fine. Well, it had a piece of grass on it. Now I fished that whole stretch <laughs> and you wonder how long that grass will be. So if you're not getting bit, change your baits. And, yeah, I get the place, man. Me too. What's your, how many different baits do you go from? I mean, bigger baits, I say bigger baits, bigger the fish. <laughs> That's like a big bait. So, if you're, <laughs> if you're fishing at night, you're, you're, you're generally fishing with bigger fish. Okay. Um, I'll go up to an F, F13, so, so for a bait that's three times the size. Okay. For someone that doesn't fish starvation very often, but wants to get a lot of fish for the kids at night for live, any good locations that you could give tips yeah, on? Yeah, any points. So I would focus on transition points, to sand, to grass, or to rock. Any points of this last weekend that I caught fish on. Okay. A jig and a crawler, I did notice that they were finicky. So they would trail a bait in. So say I got their attention, they would trail, trail, trail all the way to the boat, and they would either bite and break the boat, or they would decide just to leave. And so on a jig and a night crawler, they always, they just come in. So I would say jig and a night crawler, and I would, I can show you. How do you, how do you put the worm on the, on the jig, just get it through or? Nope, so the head first, so on the crawler, the, the dark, darker yeah. at the end, that's the head, and feed it through, and then, so I'll feed it through up, up on the jig, okay. and then I always use a, a, a jig that has a keeper. Otherwise, the crawler would just fall off down to the to the shank of the hook. Okay. And then I always use uh, a number two snow hook, and I tie that in line when I tie the jig. And I can show that presentation another time. Um, or stinger. Yep. Yep. Yeah, if there be. So you, you need to use your own stingers. You don't just clip, do the clip-on ones. No, no, by So my dad, I don't know if he learned it from someone else, but growing up, how he ties his jig is. By far the best way I've ever found out. Your your crawler sits parallel in the water, and you can put a stinger hook on there. So I use a whole night crawler when I use that way. Otherwise, I'll just use a jig and a, and a chunk of worm, just a little tidbit. Um, as long as that bar not showing, you'll catch while it's So Is so it hard bark, water? Uh, if I'm using my stinger hook, I'll use a full crawler, and I cast them. So I'll cast them, and then I'll have one sitting. How far do you do your snout, your hooks when you, when you, I do you my put leaves. a stinger, how far apart do you put Halfway down the worm, yeah. So you, you can put it half down the worm and tuck it back in the crawler or just let it sit on the outside of the crawler. Sometimes they'll just eat that. And, and you're tying all the shank of the hook? But your hooks are, your, your hooks are how far apart? Two inches, <coughs> two and a half inches. So I, when I tie them on, it's, all, it's in line, so the line is just continued. 
then it's only an inch, inch and a half, no longer too long on the on the scale one. So, so you're trying like a kind of like a drop shot and putting your finger out on the end of it. Yep. And then you can cast it. And so you get a lot of short strikes with the crawler, or you have a lot of crawler. That's so true. that little so. snow knot, you always get them and you get them perfect because they, they bite the crawler, slide down the crawler, and then it goes right to the beak. So you hardly ever <laughs> lose any fish. If you lose a fish, it's just because they didn't get it right. Inside so, the bed of the book. Yeah. Uh, Maybe draw it up on the board. Anyone have fish in line right now? Yeah, let me pull There's some out of that bucket. There's some crap up the right race board right here. So, say that's my hook. Uh, on the shank, I do a snow knot. So you run it through the eye, the line through the eye, and then you snow knot uh, on the shank. Okay. So it's snow knotted, and then your line continues. So you don't cut your tag off. So you got a knot, oh, and then okay. you got your, your stinger hook, your number two, octopus hook, your number one. Smaller, you use red ones. They like the red hooks. But then you got your crawler. So I put it halfway down the crawler, I don't put it behind on the crawler, you got the ribs on the half of the crawler, or on the crawler, about the middle. To go back any further, you kind of, when you cast it, they kind of like snag. So you want that line short and tight, yeah. and then they'll come up to snip it. And most of the time, you always get them on the back of that makes sense. And then you, you just say fish in parallel, make sure the knot on the jig is slid right to where it goes in and sit, it's sitting nice and flat in there. Yep. <coughs> You're saying keep the stinger hook short so this way when you cast it doesn't wrap around and grab your main line. Yeah, so it, yeah, it won't grab your main line, it grabs the front of the the one of the, the, of the front of the jig. So then it just falls up. Gotcha. So uh, the NWT just uh, National Wildlife Tournament, the guys got depth jigs and they're doing the same thing but they're using treble hooks at the back and they're using the heavier jig handle and they're casting them on forward. Yeah. And so that's how Max and Isaac just wanted a cast of death jigs. Yeah. And then the stingers, like a lot of guys on Oregon when they when they troll for river uh, river uh river walleye, uh they're allowed three hooks on their uh for their uh mooching setup for the three and then the last two are the stingers and that last hook always gets them it seems like they yeah. normally would take a piece of your worm off or right there. Expected it, yeah. yeah, they're being finicky and they're they're short striking you know, or if they're pants in you, so if you're using a swim bait uh, and they're grabbing and they're pulling your, your, your pants off your skirt down, then I will do the same thing on my swim baits too. I'll put put a stinger hook on the back side and I'll just plug it right inside. But you gotta make sure that the hook is gonna be able to, you can run your finger down, it's gonna snag it. Sure. Because if it's running the opposite way, it's never gonna hook the fish sure. unless they, they eat it. You found something that's kind of a little Yeah, yeah. Something like that. Yeah, so I tie it on, so the, some companies have it to where you just put, it's got like a grommet, and you just stick it on the end of the hook, mm -hmm. but then it moves on the shank. Mm -hmm. on the, yeah. It'll hold for a sec, but a few fish, and then it moves. Just tighten the line. Use your same line, and uh, and I just like how it sits in the water. It just sits okay. flush, and that warm, that warm, so you still got your action. But to try that. And there's other times you don't need it, they just eat the whole thing. But I like casting collars. That's one thing growing up, just jigging a crawler. My big, almost all my big walleye are jigging a crawler. Mm -hmm. Really? Yep. Most, my PB, 13 pounds, jigging a crawler. When I was casting a jigging a crawler. So where'd you get that at? Utah Lake. Yep, and then I got one at Starvation, jigging a crawler, Deer Creek. How deep was the water when you were jigging Utah Lake for that monster? Uh, <laughs> I peed. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. It, it yeah, oh, yeah. Nice ones. The day after I met you, I went and got a decent one. Kit caught it on a, a piece of white bass. I couldn't believe it. Oh, yeah. I thought I went on a trip out there. Huh? I thought I went on a trip. Oh, was that you that posted that picture? I'm not sure. I see. But, yeah, jig and crawler. That's, it's, if they're not biting, I found out any of this. If they're not biting, you put a jig and crawler on, Boom. They, they'll bite. <laughs> Especially if they're feeding on on bugs, so if they're if they're on a hatch, they're not going to eat something. How's the fishing right now for walleye at starvation? Is it good? Yeah, I just went there last week. Okay, no, yeah, that's, that's, well, that's, this is like recent. Yeah, this was just a few days ago. Uh, 
Let's go. Just hit the desktop one on the very left. There you go. Yeah. So, right, Connor, let's go there. Let's go. 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 Let's go.
Yeah. yeah, it makes it a little wooded, but the thing is, if you burn them a little bit faster, they swim, they start, they don't come in true. And so, especially when you're working it, you see the fish and your bait is not correlating to where you're, you know, it's swimming away from the fish, but you're reeling straight. That's what happens if you fish them. <coughs> but, yeah, I like power fishing for, for walleye. Drop shotting, you see everyone on YouTube talking about drop shotting walleye, and that's very effective too. So if you're a drop shotter, fish and nose, or any type of finesse baits, works great. Any questions? Thanks, man. That's awesome. Hey, who's been fishing? Where have you been fishing? What's working? Where? We were at Powell last week and it wasn't that good. Of <laughs> <laughs> you picked the worst, like, windstorms and yeah, stuff. Yeah, that was rough. The uh, fishing is, they're kind of in how willow it gets, where when the shad are like an inch long, they're just easy prey for the fish. Fish fill up quick. The boils were happening, they were lasting about a minute and a half, a minute. We could barely get over them. The only way you could really fish boil is if it came up right on you when you were dragging cranks. But I think it was, every shad that was coughed up was between three quarters and an inch and a quarter. So they were teeny. Like, like when the fishing dies up at Willard, I think that's what does it there. And I think that's where Pal's at right now. Another like two, three weeks, they get the shad a little bit more size the strivers can work together better and trap them, I think it'll be better. Um, really, no species at Powell was good. We caught everything, but it was a lot of time per fish. So I would avoid Powell for a couple weeks, plus the storms are rough. <laughs> Super windy? Yeah, every afternoon. Every afternoon. Was How was the boat ramp? Was there plenty of water or no? Oh yeah, there's plenty of water. And we were down there in May, so it was about 50 feet lower than it is now. And now there's beaches everywhere. It's not hard to find a camping spot. Back in May, I was wondering where we were putting a houseboat. But even in this, we, we camped in the same canyon that we fished in. And there was, there were sandy beaches everywhere. There's plenty of water. Water's not a concern. It's still pal. Every time the water changes, there's new hazards. So you have to be like alert all the time. But the storms are what got us. I think, this, I think the fishing was better in the afternoons, but we got to fish very few afternoons. I mean, it was like clockwork. Mm -hmm. Two o'clock, the clouds built. By five o'clock, it was lighting and mm -hmm. 40 to 50 mile an hour winds. And you were holding on and surviving. <laughs> and then at nine o'clock, it was over and you had the stars out. Mm -hmm. So. Can I show the pictures you sent me? Yeah. On your, on your boils, when they were boiling, uh, were you motoring up to them, or were, were they just, like, you would see them and then they would roll out? We, the, my best success was when we were on plane, like, moving, and we'd see a boil, and I'd just get to where i killed the motor and cranked, we'd slide, and I'd try to get our slide to be the direction of the oil. And so we kind of just intersect, and then we get, we'd each really get one good cast in them. So when, they when you would see the boils far away, where they last a long time? No. Okay. So what I've no. seen is, is pressure. So if the boil's going and, and most people are, oh, there's boil, they already got their motor and then they, they shoot up on it, yeah. on plane, and then they don't even think they can just catch them. But if you go in slow with your bow mount and just coast in there, then the boils. Even the, the boils that we didn't make, like if we could see one 100 yards away that we knew we had no chance at, some of them were 20 second boils. I mean, they'd come up and they'd erupt, and it was like there was either not enough striper underneath them to hold the shad in place, or the shad were too small to get out. Or they were just getting what they needed to get out of that. The water was 89 degrees. So that's that's the other issue. So is they come up for 40, 40 right. 60 feet, and by time to heat, they're out of, out of oxygen. And they got to shoot back down. Yeah. Back down. Yeah. Otherwise, they die. So that's what we were thinking. It's probably just a combination of a lot of bad, and then. Yeah. What I found is afternoon boils are a little bit better because it seems like the strikers up all day working <laughs> shot up and got cold. So, how about the water clarity? That was one. It was good. good. Clarity was good. Well, these are these are the ones that I was like, oh man, there's some rough storms. Yeah, they were. 
What was this? There's some nasty stuff that ripped down through there. Yeah, we just take pictures of light in the afternoon. <laughs> That's it. There was no place to hide. We went up to Sharner yeah. and caught that big guy. The cocaine. Right, we didn't catch very many, but we got a good one. That was the first salmon he's ever caught, so he was pretty stoked. It was fun. I took a bunch of young men up there and caught a bunch of, mostly cut through, like usual, but. <clears throat> They were only hit, the only co kokanee I only caught on the bubblegum pig. We tried a bunch of different colors and, and tried to change stuff, but co no, not very many kokanee were caught. Like there was a ton of boats out there, and I went to the ramp a couple different times, and people weren't pulling in. But most of them were small cutthroat, or they might get one big cutthroat, and then there was like a handful of kokanee. Yeah, they, they said the reports were about nine o'clock. Nine o'clock comes, and it dies off. Yep. Uh, most people get their limits between sun up, you know, five thirty to nine. Yeah. yeah, we were up there, sun up, gorgeous up there when we were up there. Yeah. I mean, it was storming down here. That's when we had like floods and stuff down here. Mm -hmm. It was really nice up, up there. Um, well, so we've also been fishing. I'll tell them about your. Oh yeah, I want to. I want to pull up your musky, man. Start telling. Them, I want to pull it up. <coughs> Uh, we went to Schofield on Saturday, first time there. My brothers and I fished it a couple of times. We just went to patrol and hang out, maybe get some tiger trout and stuff like that. And it was super slow in the morning. It seemed like all the fish were at 20 feet, but they weren't biting. There were some active uh, uh, cutties that were shooting off the bottom and coming up to about 20 feet of water off 35. We tried jigging for them. It was slow. We just picked up a fish here and there. And then we went over uh, where the first ramp is, and it was 71 degree water. And I took my boat lay up in the weeds, and I scared a bunch of those muskies out. And they uh, they came out right where the edge of the weed line was, where it was like six feet deep, and there was like some 16 year old kid there fly fishing and hooks a muskie. And not even like 15 seconds later, my brother takes one on a joint in Rapala. And then I hooked that one on a J spec, and we doubled. We had three muskies on between me and the other kid right next to us in the boat, um, and it was it was phenomenal. And they're they're a little bit bigger. We were expecting more fish like this, um, but I I I see some 45, 46 inch fish in about 10 inches of water back there, and was able to get this guy to bite right here. But there's no shortage of, of big healthy uh, musky and I caught that on eight pound test on a I usually just throw those J specs and those HD trouts I was looking for a tiger out of the weeds uh, a tiger trout and this guy if you guys want to know the whole story this is what happened it's me and my brother are fishing he hooks that fish I realize I have to grab the net and I'm leaving my shit in the water and it's from here to the table away uh, when I look the seat up, my brother's fish is running. I go to reel mine in, and the freaking muskie's sitting right there, lips my shit. I jerk the hook like this, it shoots underneath the boat. I pull the taroba up. Now my brother is on the other side. I'm not all the way around because I'm jammed up because there's a rod up there, so shit's getting crazy. So, so by the time I get over there, my brother's like, I got a good one, and then mine rolls because I originally hooked it off six foot. So it's splashing on the other side of the boat, right? On the other side, my brother's screaming that I had a good one. By the time I landed him, I had one uh, bar on my little ass uh, uh, j spec lure that hooked him, and it was a lot of fun. <laughs> Well, I'm going to go after you, man. No, there's no shortage of them. If you guys go out there, and what happened was, is I you have to spook them out of the weeds. They're piled up in there. I, I, I pulled the taroba up to where it was just barely in the water, chopping. If you go to the back of the boat, and there's like the water's like 12 foot deep, but the grass is up, and there's these weird cuts. And if you got a tall boat like your boat, and you stand off the front, you can see those muskies swimming right along, right along the weed lines. So I just took the Tarova in there, went all the way into where there just was grassing out too bad. And then when we came out, we zigzagged and we were literally just forcing like 40, 50 muskies out of these out of the grassy area. And then right where the grass meets the, the open water, they were just out there where it was like six feet deep instead of that like 20 inch stuff where you could see them from 20, 30 feet away and they were biting. So that was fun. 
Where was that at? Was it about the main bump ramp? Or is the main, the first one, the real steep one, first time there, so I don't know the, all the ramps, but it was the first ramp right when you pull in at the state park, okay. and then when you pull off the ramp, you go to the left. Immediately, it looks like it's gonna be too shallow, but if you stay committed and go through the weeds, it drops off to about six feet, and I think that's where everybody stops when they go to fish there. If you fight the weeds, there's a drop off there, and the fishing, they're just, they're just in there cruising around and there's a bunch of chubs in the weeds and you just see a lot of action. And then they just swim out real fast into the black water and you just go out there and cast it. We, got just got, it we got lucky. Was it, are the weeds what, like, like, going on? to the surface? Yeah, so when I was inside the weed lines, standing on the front, uh, it was like 10 to 12 foot deep, but the weeds were at the surface. So those muskie are using those channels to kind of maneuver through there. So when we came through, uh, we just kind of went through all the channels and you could just see the muskie dart out in pairs, just like real tight together and swim out to the edges and disappear into the black water out of the weeds. Um, and that's when we decided to uh, start throwing some lures out there and, and, and that's how that went. So could you work top water? Uh, well, we, no. We, my brother threw a, a whopper plopper on originally when we started sightseeing them. It was kind of like farming bass for a second. You would just come through and you could see it like 30, 40 feet away just sitting right next to a bush. But the, the whopper plopper was foul hooking on, uh, on obstructions that were some of the weeds made it to the surface and curled. And uh, it was hard to find a good patch. But if you're good enough, I would recommend a fly guy come in there, stand on the bow of his boat, spot lock and fish those deep water lead uh, weed lines that, that kind of spider web out. Those muskie are just using those for egresses to move through there and pick off those chubs. Yeah, you'd use them for runways. Exactly. And, and they're sit, not they're, they sit there and wait for bait to go across it or to go from deep water to shallow. Yeah, they're only like six inches wide and some of them are 30 inches wide. But if you just sit there and you're fishing another area out of the corner of your eye, Musky aren't very stealthy and they don't have great camouflage. They're like logs, very dark objects. You can just see silhouettes of them just cruising through right there. So, what was the biggest one you seen? Ah, uh, the one I caught. That's I was honestly seeing more 35 inches and 40 inches and a couple that looked big, but it was just at that depth to where you really couldn't pick it up. It was more of a silhouette. I smoked pot, so who the fuck knows what I saw. But uh, <laughs> but uh, but we did see plenty. But the biggest Ooh. one that I seen was the most. Little. That's great. Hey, I forgot, to, I forgot to have you tell us about the tournament. Oh, yeah. So I put on a, a tournament series this year. We're going to a full series. It's going to be next year. But uh, the first one was at Willard. And uh, Ben and Greg, they killed it. Uh, Two-day tournament, and they weighed in 33 pounds. It was a caption release uh, conservation tournament. but So every fish lit, and there was a big fish. It was a... Uh, I'm not sure how exactly how big it was, but and where'd that money go? That was a fundraiser for no. This one, this one was a 80/20 payout. So uh, oh, I see. Next year we're going to do a full series uh, from May 15th. Dates are not set set stone yet, but Whaler, Deer Creek, Starvation, and we're going to work it with a different lake throwing a uh, different lake in there. But all the places you go, friends. I'm, I'm not fishing, so yeah. I'm the tournament director, and uh, I won't be fishing. So if you don't have to fish, <laughs> but these guys got the fishing hands. Great one, fishing. <laughs> there's a, there's some serious sticks to fish fish that tournament. I yeah, mean, two, I, day, two days. Basically, the guys days. who own Willard essentially fish that tournament. But the um, starvation class is coming up too. Yeah. So I, I September ninth. Yeah, September 9th. Um, I got a, I got an Airbnb that I'm I think we've almost got it full with like six guys, but we're all going to be going up, and there's going to be some guys who are volunteering, and some guys who are fishing it. Um, so I think, I think we've got like three three boats for the club that are going to be fishing that one, and that 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 one's the longest running one. So so Tristan and, and Kirk Bossy actually Kirk gave us a whole bunch of if you want a bait towel, he gave us a bunch of leftover bait towels from last year. If you want a bait towel. Um, you can come grab one of these. But he, he's been putting that on for a while. Um, he, t he took the tournament over from someone else. And this is his fourth year. His fourth, his fourth year, yeah. And uh, 
So we're trying to expand that, the, the club's been trying to expand that one into a tournament series. And so Tristan's kind of taken a lot of that on with trying to expand that tournament. Yep. So, so we're going to work together on uh, the classics, it's always going to be the classic. Um, that's been going on for 33 years. Um, we're going to partner in, run in the classic, and then put on tournament series. So they're going to be catch and release and uh, live uh, wave tournaments, like the classic. Uh, when we're going to do the catch and release is when it's the water above 70 degrees for, our, uh, for conservation. If we would have kept on that tournament within two or three minutes that fish being out and it was 103 degrees, they don't last. There's no way you can have a live tournament and you have a ton of fish coming in. Uh, so we're doing conservation and live weigh ins. So we start with four and then we're also going, we're thinking about doing Thursday night uh, league nights. So every Thursday, uh, we're thinking of doing um, Thursdays will be at Willard uh, and then we're thinking of doing different bodies of water so that's another thing uh, going forward so mix, we're in a mix of a few things so just kind of getting it off the ground this year yep. uh, Shields has been a great sponsor for it we're trying to work with them um, to help sponsor some of that and then Kirk's got he, because that tournament's been running so long, they have a good following there. Yeah. Um, we're hoping that. 40, yeah, last year was 42 boats. This year we should see 40 plus. So yeah. We're hoping time. to get it to the point where people got to really register, kind of like ice and and stuff like that. So, yeah, if you're interested in you, even just come, I, I would recommend, even if you don't want to fish that tournament, come up and check it out. Like, just, just come up that one morning, and the hype of this is pretty fun, man. We got 40, 50 boats. Just waiting in the bay, and you have to launch off. There's, yeah. it, it gets you kind of like a little drone. Yeah. yeah, you get and to your spot, you almost can't can't get your rods in the water. Yeah, so adrenaline. But but there's a lot. It's it's really fun to just kind of rub shoulders with the guys and kind of overhear what they're talking about. You know, if you go and you listen really good, you can pick up some good stuff. You know, because as much as these guys don't want to share everything, they love to talk. So. <laughs> um, but uh, yeah, so that's September 9th. There's, there's a raffle too. Oh, yeah, yeah. Uh, WCF does a raffle. So that's that. Like $10,000 worth of prizes. Yeah. Like last time they did a safe full of guns. Like, and so you can, and all of that goes towards conservation. And that's actually what helped pay for the habitat. materials for the, the fish habitat structures that we built that Natalie's hoping and hopefully going to be putting out this next week. So that's kind of how that whole circle happens where we're trying to help with conservation. Um, we, we partner with DWR, uh, the DNR, and you know, tournament funds money that way. And they, they do that through the 501C, which is the WCF. So when we, all that money that they donate ends up going back into conservation and they, they get it to start. So Saturday, right? Saturday's the? Saturday's the raffle. So yeah, Friday night, they, they take them all. You can, you can start buying raffle tickets on Friday, but then Saturday, I think the gun safe, they usually like limit how many people can do that. I think it's like max. 30 or something like that because those tickets are more expensive but then they have a whole bunch of other stuff and shields is gonna shields isn't sponsoring with money this year they're gonna sponsor with gear so there should be some more fishing stuff than just hunting stuff because wcf mostly does hunting stuff but we should have some decent fish <coughs> there too but it's a lot of fun um so you can go up there and just kind of check it out and see and then maybe next year you'll fish it you know i, I went up last year it was my first time it was kind of intimidating we great fished it and caught a really big fish the day before the tournament <laughs> <laughs> and then nothing else <laughs> but it was still fun it's still the biggest baseball i've had in my boat it was 27 inches so it was pretty pretty sweet um but yeah that's gone so can you, um can you, are you gonna send that out in a mail or like an email to everybody so we can see yeah so yeah, it's just if you just go to utah walleye.com that's the tournament series that he's got. That's that's Kirk Bostick's website. Um, and if you just go to the tournaments, it's going to be the 33rd annual Star Reach Walleye Classic. So I think if you just go to register now, that's how you register for the event. Oh, so that's a big payout there. Three hundred dollar buy-in. Is that what I said for a team? Yeah. Yeah. yeah big it's, fish. So you have fifty dollars for big fish. And there's big fish. And then our club sponsors the Comeback Kid Award. So we give them two hundred bucks, and that two hundred bucks goes straight to whoever wins the Comeback Kid Award. Oh, that's awesome. Because it's a two day it's a two day tournament. So yeah, it's a decent payout. Um, it's it's the biggest big boy tournament of walleye in Utah that we have right now. Um, hopefully we can make it even. 
bigger. So the, series, the series would be fun to do. Have mm -hmm. you read shirt? I did. Did you get anything back confirming it? I think so. Yeah, yeah you I did, did a return design. Check, check it out. Check. Yeah, mm -hmm. I didn't get anything back. Yeah, I got something. I got something back. Try to get back. But if you're thinking about doing it, they've got they still got campsites up there at Fred Hayes that you can camp up there if you've got an RV or whatever. Or there's still I think you can still probably find some hotels. It's not it's not too bad yet. But I do it. There's a lot soon. more options than there used to be. Yeah, because a lot of the guys just they register same day of the tournament, and I think in the next couple of years you won't want to be registering same day of the tournament because there might not be any spots. Left. Sixty boats, starvation. In, uh, That's the max. The permit is sixty, so we're 42, 43 boats. So. Pretty soon it's going to be, you better sign up or you're not chance. All right, well, we're over time. I got I to gotta do these door prizes and give you guys time to go you find stuff. Oh, yeah, yeah, please do. Show me, show, I, I show just, us your green lights. I don't know how many people are interested in making their own green lights, but uh, but I just, all there's a piece of PVC, and you can get your, your lights, buy them online. They come in a string like that. And uh, they're they're about twenty bucks to buy the lights. You got the PVC, you got your cord, you got your cigarette lighter. You just need to solder an iron and, and a little bit of shrink wrap tape. And the I'll just start even write down here what what you want. You want the the five meter and you want the fifth. The 50, 50. I'll plug this in. That's okay. Lights, and and they're they're uh, yeah. If I can remember all the stuff, you want the IP68, and you want the tube type of waterproofing, uh, and 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 you can buy them a lot of places. Uh, they also make the IP68 Nano, and that's what this one is. It's just a coating. I I'm, I made this one, but I haven't hooked up my wires or anything on it yet. I don't know how long that's going to hold up beating around the boat. I think the type that's on the got the tube is going to work a lot a lot better. And I just run a bolt through the top and uh, zip tie my line on and. I, of the tie them. They sink. Uh, simple. You can make one for about 40 bucks. I like to use three at a time. So if you go out and buy them, they're going to cost you $450. You can, for a lot less, you know, 120 you can make them yourself. And it's not that hard to <coughs> solder some wires up. So you can look at these. I'll talk to you more if, you, if anybody's interested in making them. <coughs> Thanks, Danny. <clears throat> okay, so we do our honors and start drawing. We'll do some. Uh, we've got a whole, get whole get bunch of tickets done. Huh? Do you get oh, you're not going to take yet? Uh, I come in late. Can you grab him and take it? Yeah, it's right there. Yeah, you did good with the last route that we had. Yeah, I'm going to have you put my tickets in for us. <laughs> okay. Yeah, we're starting. I just, last time I. I advised you to put it in for me, and gee, I won a couple times. And the time for I come up with a bone in, I didn't win anything. Just go ahead and start pulling them out, and I'll just start handling them out the price and saying what the hell to hand them out. You can, just, you can just do the last four, three numbers. So 0119? 0119. That's me. You have moon eyes. <laughs> Sweet. <laughs> I'm gonna flick it over. One, two, two. That's me. Awesome. It's nice too. One, one. Uh, this is for flicker shad. Seven. One, one, four. Yep. One, one, four. Here we go. One. So how are you? Yeah, keep, just keep going. One, one, zero. One, one, zero. That's you. Thank you. You got a nice Rapala. One, zero, seven. Me. Oh, nice. Good job. <laughs> <laughs> That's a nice one. I want to play one.
Here's another Rapala deep runner. Number seven, Birch. That's a one, two, three. One, two, three, and one? That's the You <laughs> <laughs> got a couple slip boppers. One, one, one. You hit slip boppers. So I get the context. Try and train with somebody. One, one, two. Nice. That takes one days. I want some last time. I do two packs. Okay, two more. We'll do two slip boppers for each of those. One, zero, two. One, zero, two. No, one, twenty. One, twenty? One, twenty. There you go. Some slip boppers. There you go. Keep going, we've got four more. One zero six. There you go, some slip And then we've got some uh some of these crawler harnesses. I like these float on spring. These are nice the Colorado blades. One one seven. One one seven. Two more. One, two, five. One, two, five. Over here. One more. One, one, three. One, one, three. Hey. There you go. But everybody can grab if you want. You can grab a bait towel so nobody leaves empty handed tonight. If you like a bait towel. We've got a nice little clip on. Okay. Just talk to Tristan. Yeah. Grab one. Oh. And you got some chips too. You want it? You want it? You want it? Beef. Oh. And what is it? Um. Twelve thirty for all of it. So six. Six fifteen. Six fifteen.